So I, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, we're talking about like the, basically the stories that are being told. And, and, and part of that is like the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are that helps drive us. Um, but I kind of wonder, this is the part where we dive off the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wonder about earlier, you know, I mentioned that my, my business mentor and friend often says there is no meaning. So we imbue meaning upon our own lives. But I also sometimes struggle with, is there, you know, a, a larger meaning to life? And I want to kind of get your thoughts on if the purpose of humanity and the existence that we live is to create. So meaning of life, Megan. Oh, you're up. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think it could be. I, I think that, you know, again, it all depends on personal framework, spiritual background and things like that. But I think that if there is a pressure to create as a meaning, that also derive like pushes against what we're trying to say of like, you know, from this inherent, you know, quadrillions of atoms all bumping against each other in semi-random ways, like, you know, from that you can find lo self-love and acceptance. Like, I think if we're saying you have to, like, if creation is, is an element of that, then yeah, maybe that's supported by like spiritual frameworks. But maybe you look at the universe and you're like, well, we got infinite expansion going on here and it's all going to cool to nothing. So, but yeah, so I, I think like essentially, I don't know, I would say that creation is, 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 it's really interesting to think about. And maybe that's like a, you know, the spiritual end, like the, what we're looking with, not what we're looking for is creation. I could see that. I mean, I'd love to hear what you have to say. In fact, I should have asked that first. Um, so like, <laughs> okay. So what, are, what are you thinking when you're saying that? Okay, so let me explain a little bit more. And, and, and you guys fit in this framework, which is why I, I went there. So <laughs> philosophically, when I'm thinking about um, like entrepreneurial ventures or like trying to make money, you know, some people will frame it in the context of like, if I make money, I'm stealing from you, right? That's a very negative, like, bad way to frame it um, and I don't think it's true whereas I think of it as when like say like in this context when a transaction takes place I have given you more value than it requires for you to give me in the form of money money is just stored value so in essence I have created more than I have received for that transaction to take place that being said, to come from that place where you're saying, I'm creating value, you are coming from a place where you are trying to build up and create something out of nothing. You know, products, software, software in particular, software is almost like magic because you're writing code and you're, you're making something happen that didn't exist before just because you're using your brain. There's no like, there's almost, I'll say there's no physical thing involved, but it's obviously not entirely true since we have computers. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm coming from the place where basically I, I think you guys come from a place of love and trying to share that with people. And there is a creative, and I don't mean creative in an artistic sense, but creative in the building up sense of mm -hmm. allowing people to become more than they were previously when you come from that place of love and you're trying to not just make them better runners, but make them better people. I think that's part of your aim. I mean, you're welcome to correct me. Um, it, so that's when I think of humanity as a creative process and the purpose as a creative process, not necessarily because there is a, a big M Plato and big M meaning, but because that is somewhat inherent in our existence that when we get together as a society, as a culture, and we create together and give value to each other, that we all become more because of that process. 
that's kind of where I'm coming from. That's interesting. So I think for me, I think about like value and the creative process as kind of all being in the eyes of the beholder. So I think that's like a very, I think for everyone that process looks very different. And for some people it might be like, maybe you're the checkout person doing groceries and the value and the creative process that you're adding to the world is smiling at every single customer that comes in and making jokes and being that like the life of the grocery store and being that awesome person. And so I think it's like, it's truly about giving your full authentic self to the world in a way that lifts other people up. And that's where that like collective creativity comes in. It doesn't have to be like these like personal actions or like these to-do lists or like these like set products that get released to the world. It's just about like creating love and joy and building up other people in that process. Yeah. And I mean, I think the hard part here is like, we haven't found transcendence, you know, in, in there are people that describe what transcendence feels like to them, whether that's like Jesus or, Buddha, or it's like the, you know, I don't want to butcher the names, um, but the more new age, the more new age type things, or even the people that have like hallucinogenic experiences or whatever. And they almost all are, are trending towards this idea of like oneness, whatever that means to them individually. And so I think that that creation and like the the giving and in, in that element is inherent in all those things. And the fact that it does overlap across all these different backgrounds is so cool and interesting. Um, and I don't think anyone really gets gets it fully unless you fu- like had that, you know, unless you're like a, like one of those beings that has had that moment. And, you know, so it's it's super cool because we're all trying to talk about something that can only be explained in metaphors, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where that's where like what we try to do is instead of telling people how to feel necessarily, we're just trying to be like, hey, just know that this is all a metaphor. Like. And from there, you can derive the own mean- your own meaning to the mystery or whatever. And we're not going to give you that because we don't know it at all. Um, and so I love the idea of creation because my guess is that's how it manifests to an entrepreneurial spirit like you. Like that's where that's where you find it. Um, and it might be your descri- how you describe the same thing that Megan's saying at the checkout counter. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, well, so I talk about this sometimes too. And I ask people... Like, do you speak another language? Often no, but um, it, if you learn another language, and I, I guess I'll say I'm passable in French, um, you kind of begin to understand a different way to look at things because the way our language is structured is part of the lens in which we view the world and communicate with each other. So like, German is, a, German is a good example. There's tons of words in German that are very, very specific to a very specific situation and feeling that we just don't have in English. <laughs> so we have to like fumble around and try to describe that experience without a word. So it almost forces your perception into a particular box, depending on which language you speak, because you don't have the tools available to you to describe those nuances sometimes. That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, that, that reminds me of like the Michael Pollan book about hallucinogens or, you know, I like we've never done them. Maybe we should with all this talk. But um, I, yeah, I keep thinking that I'm like, I'm generally I'm per, like, pretty anti drug. Like I don't I drink don't drink soda. I pretty much don't drink alcohol. And I'm like, maybe I should do mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I have stories. They cause like mass amounts of vomiting sometimes. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but um. I think we should give hallucinogens to Congress. That might <laughs> that might help. Um, but no, like, you know, one thing that's interesting in coaching is you get windows into a lot of people's lives. And over time, you can often build pretty close relationships, like lots of intimacy. And sometimes when like, when people just seem to get it, like whatever it is in a way that even like I would, I would strive to, I'll ask them that and like, oh yeah, I, I definitely, I had some, you know, hallucinogens back in my day or whatever. Uh, and I think that's so fascinating because it's probably the same idea, right? That for, it obviously varies by the person and experience, but some people have these experiences where it lets them escape the constraints of the language we know of like the language of, you know, being a meat sack essentially. <laughs> yes. um, and um, yeah, so it, it's funny because I feel like what we're trying to do is, um, translate things we've heard third hand and apply it to athletics so you know it gets complicated sometimes to describe it in a way that's super actionable Mm -hmm. um so i'm not saying take mushrooms but i am saying uh read you know (laughs) read read what really smart people have to say on these issues like (laughs) listeners not to you um because i think like 
the 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 thing to find there is not like this is the answer. The thing to find there is that not knowing the answer is the answer. And so um, that's kind of the journey we try to we try to use athletics as the lens through which we can help people on. Um, and so, yeah. I like that. Yeah, thank you. I needed that. I was like, please, <laughs> please be okay. Please, please be okay. <laughs> yeah, it it kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, metaphor. There's a metaphor in Buddhism about um, that the, the lesson is the finger pointing to the moon, not the moon itself. Like it, people get wrapped up in the metaphor and thinking that that is the lesson. It's like, no, it's just showing you where the lesson is. I can't show you the actual lesson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I totally, totally agree. And I, I imagine that's how all teaching works. All, you know, whether you're like how a good CEO needs to work and, you know, all that. And I think the hardest thing in coaching in particular that we've, I think both had to learn over time is that you're not in control. You're not trying to micromanage someone's lives. Like it's the opposite of what Alberto Salazar did with his athletes. That's the idea of the bad coach, even right. though they had results for whatever reason, like that is someone that tried to ex explore every little thing, control it and manipulate it. And as a result, ruined people. Yeah, I was gonna say that I think that's that micromanagement is only possible in the short term. So again, in the long term, it's like impossible to control all those things. Or it's like, it's so against the nature of the human that they like ultimately explode. Um, and so I think like, I think that's really like a short term results focused oriented mindset. Yeah. You guys explore this in, in the, the book. And I actually, um, funny enough, I, I had this, you know, we had this interview coming up. I didn't even necessarily put the two together, but I just did a video on um, why run. Mm -hmm. And I often talk about, I, I use the metaphor about it's a bag of whys. It's the best way I am <laughs> to describe okay. it. Like you need more than a singular why to define how you do it. But um, do you guys have like a practice you go back to when one why is not, you know, not fulfilling you anymore? And you're like, you know, that why is not very strong anymore. Do you have something concrete that you go to or do you just kind of let another why organically come to you or, or your athletes, I guess? And we like people to think about it really explicitly as much as possible, just because it gets back to the same discussion we're having that, you know, these unexamined questions, it's not that you can ignore them. It's that if you ignore them, it all just blows up in your face eventually. Um, so you're just pushing it, put, kicking the can. So yeah, we just like athletes to have this why that's grounded in like internal positive reasons, like internal self-love oriented reasons. Like, and so what we really try to motivate is a why that's focused on like the day-to-day -day process is one that you choose because of the type of person it lets you be. Um, because I think running for running to feel good or whatever is a terrible reason to run because running freaking sucks sometimes. <laughs> um, and you know, often it sucks. And, um, so it has to be for reasons that might like also, um, accommodate like the fact that it is really not, it's difficult sometimes it's super difficult sometimes. So, um, you know, I think both of us have whys that are really grounded in like, you know, uh, you know, it lets us have these loving thoughts. It lets us, like, it lets us turn down the volume inside our heads a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, like, that's where it comes from for us. But even if it's not that, something that, like, does a similar mechanism, you know, that adds to your life rather than subtracts and adds unconditionally. And I think getting back to that point, I think it's really helpful to like have a good understanding of who you are and feeling authentic in that process. But I also think just trusting your intuition. It's like, like for me personally, I know that I'm happiest when like things are lighthearted, things are funny, there's a lot of comedy and humor. And so it's like a lot of my why goals are focused on finding that lightness. It's like focused on like laughing at myself, laughing at the situation. And I think, um, I think once I have that framework for what truly makes me happy, what lights my soul on fire, it's a lot easier to then say, hey, this is my why, this is what I want to be doing. Yeah, I mean, we encourage athletes like to take their phones on runs just so that they're always able to take photos. Like as weird as that little why is, like it just engages you with what you're doing a little bit. And it starts- And to play Space Jam. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and to play the Space Jam, Jam soundtrack. All time on, great. On repeat. <laughs> on repeat. Um, but yeah, like th things like that. like 
that the narrative, like, and that's why we draw the narrative away from results, because, you know, if that, if that's the narrative, if that ends up being the why, that always ends in disaster, always, eventually. And it's just a question of when. And so sometimes it can work for a really long time. And those people, I think, would, would say, you know, would call BS on this. And, that, you know, maybe they're an exception, but usually it's just a, it's a ticking time, Mom. Megan, before we run out of time, I, I want to pick on you a little bit. Yeah, sure. Go for it. I like um, it. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> I, I think in the book, you kind of describe being very motivated, even as a young child and all the way through yes. now. And I think David earlier had mentioned that you're working on your PhD. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, she's working for, and she's doing a startup. A, so a startup that does genetic testing for athletes. Right. And she's doing a fellowship. And she's coaching. And right. So, so, yeah, so, <laughs> so we have to get to why? <laughs> why? Like, yeah, I mean, you already have your MD. Why why are we why are you doing your PhD? Like what I mean, what's what's the why behind the kind of path that you've taken? Yeah, so it's both, I think it's probably both like intuition based. Like that is honestly what lights my soul on fire and both practical based. So I'll start with intuition. Like I honestly just love learning. Like I love being in the classroom. I love like learning. I love challenging myself. And school is a very convenient environment for that. And in a PhD, you actually get to get paid and go to school. So for me, it's like a dream job. And I'm doing research related to running. So it's it's kind of all synergistic in terms of right. like the things I love. It supports the, the athletes. Like the information that I'm learning in the PhD directly supports SWAP, which is really fun. And then I think from a practical standpoint, so I went to med school thinking that I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I got into med school and very quickly realized that 100 hour work weeks were just not my jam. Like I am happiest when I have time to be out in nature, when I'm running on the trails, when I have time to spend with loved ones with Addy Dog and going on to do residency and like clinically practicing medicine was just not conducive for that. Um, and that was where like the PhD just made so much more logistical sense. Okay. Yeah. I, it's always just curious like how people take these paths because you know, you know, I guess I'll say as children, I'm oversimplifying, but you know, as children, when there's we, we have some semblance of thinking like, I'll be a doctor, I'll be an artist. And you, you look at it as, as this almost like linear progression, especially in the case of a doctor, like I'm going to go to high school, graduate high school, then I'm going to college, be pre-med, and then I'm going to get into med school, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do rent. Like it's, it's very laid out. But often, especially for people like you guys, myself as well, life kind of wiggles and waggles and it isn't quite as straight as you think it's going to be. Well, Michelle Obama, actually, she's, her book is so good, but she talks about the power of swerving in a career and in life. And I feel like my life has very much swerved to mm -hmm. kind of fit around what I find the most joy in, like what my like base core priorities are. And I think it's really helpful to like, to like know this base core priorities and make all of your decisions surrounding that. So like for me, it's like, I want to run, I want to spend time with family. I want to do these things that I enjoy. And, and so it's like work has to fit within that framework and I'm going to swerve work around so that it, so that it actually works out. Yeah. Well, thanks for answering. As I said, it was, it was a personal curiosity, but I had to ask before we, before we ran it. Yeah, thank you. No, that's awesome. Um, this is the question that I ask everybody. You may, guys may have seen if you know you watch the other episodes, but I, I like to ask everybody because this is a universal. If after a hard workout or a hard race, you are choosing a recovery food and you can only choose one food for the rest of your life, what do you choose? Food for recovery. This is a great, great question. I would probably go with pepperoni pizza. This is why we're married. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even plan this ahead of time. Did, that should... We should, okay, that bigger question is, is like, where would you get your pepperoni pizza from? Because we've had a lot of pepperoni pizza well, in life. Well, Legends Pizza. Yeah, let, so, we, we go to this place called Legends. It's in Cupertino, and they've got some other places in California. But literally, when you lift the pizza up off the pan, it has, like, a cheese vertical. So, like, you can lift the pizza up high, and there's, like, three feet of cheese that's just, like, trailing the pizza as you're lifting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should yeah. probably do more blood tests to make sure our cholesterol is all good. <laughs> no, I think but, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, this, that place is, I think I could do that every meal for the rest of our lives. I totally agree. That's a great, I, was, I love people's answers because like I get, I get a mix of like pizza or beer or ice cream. I love ice cream. Um, and then also get like, like the PC answers, like something with four to one carb to protein ratio. Like it's just, I love seeing everybody's different answers. I'm hoping, 
I don't know that I'll put it into a book, but I am eventually going to like compile everybody's like answers into something, maybe an infographic or something. Kind of see. I'll, I'll just see like personality tests and then like food answers and get to like match them. Like, I feel like you could really predict that. Yeah. Yeah. Might be a good way to, to see if we're, if like we aren't for someone is like, <laughs> yeah, you say celery, probably not going to love us. <laughs> probably not the best match. And like protein and carb ratios. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're just all about like the cheese ratio. That's yeah. Like yeah. The one ratio we got going. That's how we judge all foods. It yeah. ends up being a little weird, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys. Um, so if people want to find you, find out more about Swap, pick up the book, obviously, where can they do all that? Probably the most important place is Addie Dog herself. So Addie has a big vo uh, voice in the book. She's our furry dog friend. Yep. Um, and so her Instagram handle, which is also David's Instagram handle, is Addie Does Stuff. Um, I am Meg Runs Happy on Instagram. The book's on Amazon. Our website is Swap Running. And that's it. We're generally Googleable. Yeah. Googleable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And our email's out there. And so if anyone's listening and ever has a question about literally anything, um, even if it's like has nothing to do with coaching or anything like that, we'd always like to try to help and answer and um, yeah, get to meet you. Sounds awesome. Thanks for spending some time with me today and allowing me to prod you guys a little bit. <laughs> this was so fun. You're so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.